Hello everyone, I am excited to tell you about the wonder of lifestyle medicine. I am Dr. David Donahue and this is my practice, Progressive Health of Delaware. I don't know if you can pick me out in the photo with all the ladies, I kind of blend in with everybody. My goal today is to give you six operating principles of lifestyle medicine that could benefit your patients, your family, and yourself and give you seven exciting insights that can change how you practice medicine. If you practice medicine, and if you don't practice medicine, then, well, it's seven exciting insights anyway. The whole talk is going to be quick. It's going to be like a lightning round. So hang on to your seats. We're going to start with operating principle number one, and that is that the same six lifestyle factors can treat many illnesses. So it turns out that it's there's not one lifestyle to treat heart health and another one to treat liver health and another for brain health. It's all, for the most part, very similar. It's basically the same lifestyle. And in particular, it is this, these six categories of lifestyle behavior, and we call them the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. They include healthy eating, healthy physical activity, usually increasing our physical activity, a healthy relationship with stress, avoiding toxic, risky, and addictive substances, improving our sleep, and then forming and maintaining those healthy, loving, and supportive relationships. So we know that those six pillars of lifestyle medicine work. They work to keep the heart healthy. We have a lot of research that speaks to the same pillars are what keeps our heart healthy and prevents atherosclerotic and cardiovascular disease, whereas it is the way that people often live in our standard American lifestyle that promotes heart disease, including the diet, our, our sedentary behavior, poor sleep, poor stress, uh, chronic stress, and loneliness, social isolation. And it's the same lifestyle factors that play a big role in whether we develop uh, dementia, uh, uh, whether we start heading towards Alzheimer's disease, and similarly, it is the same harmful factors that can hasten our development of Alzheimer's disease. Operating principle number two is that it's better to treat the root cause of disease than to treat the symptoms. So this is something that traditional medicine does a decent job of when you talk about this condition, and this is somebody smoking. She, let's say the smoker's developing a cough. Well, we don't tell smokers who are developing a cough, well, here's a cough medicine to make your cough better. We say stop smoking. We say treat the root, of, root cause of the problem. And so, so it should be with all our pillars of lifestyle medicine. So let me give you an example. Jane, a 69-year-old retired nurse who came to see me, Jane was struck with obesity, new onset type 2 diabetes, hypertension, acid reflux, depression, and gout. She takes seven medicines for these conditions. She has low energy and what she calls diffuse pains. She doesn't want to take more medicine. She's sick of being sick. She's worried about her risk of a heart attack, and her LDL is 95. That's her low-density lipoprotein, the bad cholesterol, and her blood pressure is 130 over 83. So how can we best help Jane to prevent a heart attack? Do we, A, refer her to cardiology, B, start fentermine, a weight loss pill, C, coach her to change to a whole food plant-based diet, D, refer to a dietitian, or E, refer to endocrinology? And the answer is coach her to change to a whole food plant-based diet. And the reason I say that is because that's what the guidelines recommend. That's what the U United States Preventive Services Task Force recommends as, as an approach to for adults who are obese or have additional cardiovascular disease risk factors. They recommend intensive behavioral counseling interventions to promote a healthy diet and physical activity for CVD, for cardiovascular disease prevention. This is a B-grade recommendation, which means it has a very high degree of evidence and certainty that this is the right approach. And similarly, the guidelines from the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, on how to uh, prevent cardiovascular disease say that healthy lifestyle counseling is step one, and this should be the first thing that we do in medicine, but unfortunately, it's not always the first thing we do, and oftentimes we're trained, and I was trained in my training of medicine, that we kind of skip over that and jump to the medicines. And the same with regard to blood pressure. The JNC8 hypertension guideline algorithm says implement health, 
uh, lifestyle modifications as step one, so that we really should focus on that. So what Jane did is she focused on this one pillar of healthy eating, and that's the only thing she changed. And after changing her diet, Jane had marvelous results. So after five months, she was able to lose 30 pounds. She was able to uh, get off all seven of her medications. She was a little more aggressive at stopping her medicines than I wanted to, but this, is, this was her choice. And she was able to reverse her sort of borderline pre-diabetes or diabetes state. So this is what we call disease reversal. And it, it's a thing. It actually works. So when Jane told her story of what is it, how did she do it? The answer is she immediately took all animal products and processed food out of her diet. She, what, what I eat is starch centered. A lot of potatoes, beans, rice, legumes, and grains. I have fresh fruit or vegetables with every meal. I eat as much as I need to not be hungry. And she stops eating at 6 p.m. So there's a lot of wisdom in what Jane has done and it really can work. So operating principle number three is that many chronic diseases are reversible if treated early enough and with a high enough dose of lifestyle change. So you can think of healthy lifestyle as a dose like a medicine, and when you take it in high doses, you can re be rewarded with very significant results. One of the things that Jane did was this idea of calorie density. So when she's eating foods like fruits and vegetables, these foods are calorie dilute. They're gonna fill up the stomach. So 500 calories of fruits and veggies almost fills up the stomach as does 500 calories of potatoes, beans, and grains. But when we move to eating more uh, processed foods like cheeses, more oily foods, and, uh, or, or breads and sweets, or even the meats, they tend to be more calorie dense. So these foods don't fill up the stomach as much. So research has been done looking at this concept of satiety index. What is it about a food that makes us, makes us feel satiated and full? And it turns out that the, the water content of the food is the number one determinant of satiety. The fiber content is number two. The protein content is number three. And when foods have more fat, they are more fattening. So they, they have the opposite effect. The more, the more fiber and water and protein in a food, the more satiating it is. The more fat in the food, the more fattening it is. So here's an exciting insight. The best approach to long-term weight ma management is to eat many whole plant foods. Here's another thought. When a person like this comes to see you, or when you, when you know somebody in your life who has this long list of diseases um, like uh, this lady does, the thing that should be jumping out at you is that it doesn't have to be this way. We are not programmed to have these diseases necessarily start happening to us. They're happening for a reason and most of, most of the chronic diseases that we address in modern medicine and most of the chronic diseases that we experience as patients are the result of a Western lifestyle, in particular the food that we eat. So from head to toe, whether we're talking about Alzheimer's, dementia, anxiety, depression, or diseases of the vascular system, diseases of the heart, diseases of the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, the organs, the gastrointestinal system, the musculoskeletal system, the pain that we are experiencing in our joints and our tendons, all the way down to whether we get gout, neuropathy, plantar fasciitis, head to toe, so many of the diseases we suffer are what we call diseases of Western civilization, particularly because of the diet we eat. And when we shift to a healthier a pattern of eating and eating more whole plant foods, unprocessed foods with their natural fiber and with all the flavonoids and the colors and the vitamins in that, that are packaged in those foods, we can experience benefits, again, from head to toe. Everything from better cognition and better mood to less inflammation, less pain, uh, and better functioning, and more spring in our step. So operating principle number four that is that nutrition is super important. All the pillars are important, but nutrition is super important. We recommend these seven uh, categories of foods, these seven food groups in the whole food plant-based world. They include the, the in intact whole grains, the fruits and vegetables, the legumes, so rich in fiber and protein, nuts and seeds, which are kind of a longevity food, uh, one serving a day, a quarter cup a day, uh, mushrooms, which should probably be eaten at least three times a week, and finally, herbs and spices. So I say there's about seven food groups. One of the reasons why we say diet is such an important risk factor is that 
Uh, per research from IHME and the Global Burden of Disease study that's done periodically in, in the United States and throughout the world, what they find is that the number one contributor to death and disability is the food that we eat, our dietary risks. And if you look at the top seven causes of death and disability, five of them are directly related to the food we eat, our high blood pressure, our high fasting glucose, our high body mass index, and the high LDL. So what is it about the food that we eat? So the researchers went on to dig deeper and look, look at extensive body of research that's been done to say, well, what, which, what is the nature of our diet that's contributing to death and disability? Is it too much saturated fat? Is it too much sugar? And the answer is it's a diet low in whole grains and high in sodium. They're kind of tied for number one. Um, so too much sodium, that, that's a marker for processed foods, which we know are harmful. And, but the other thing about sodium is that sodium directly harms our vascular system. It raises our blood pressure and it uh, incurs more damage to many, many of our organs uh, when we eat high sodium foods. Also, uh, you would think, well, of all the different classes of the, the food groups of the plant-based world, low in grains being number one is surprising. But keep in mind that low in fruit was a, a close third place, low in nuts and seeds, low in vegetables. So we want to be eating those vegetables, the nuts, seeds, the fruits, the, the whole grains, and reducing the sodium. Let's look at another case briefly. Venkat, a 42-year-old IT professional, came to see me, and he had developed type 2 diabetes recently. Um, his weight had crept up. He was eating a, a more Western diet, uh, and he started gaining more and more weight. His triglycerides, total cholesterol were high, his LDL, and his systolic blood pressure all elevated. We uh, went, he went through our Cure Diabetes program, which is our eight-week uh, disease reversal program, an, an educational program in which we teach people about the pillars of healthy lifestyle. And in particular, we share that um, there's a powerful ability with food. And food has a, a major role in our diseases, and we have a lot of power when we change our food and when we change our lifestyle. And so it, this happens to be exactly what the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists recommends as our approach to type 2 diabetes. They say, number one, lifestyle modification underlies all therapy. And in particular, what about lifestyle? It is uh, the same pillars of lifestyle medicine, including a plant-based diet, as the best way of managing type 2 diabetes. So how has Venkat done? Well, at three months, he was able to drop his hemoglobin A1C uh, down to 6.2 into the non-diabetic range. He lost 15 pounds. His cholesterol comes down dramatically, his LDL, his triglycerides, his systolic blood pressure. He maintained that at a year. And it's been some years since that initial encounter, and he's, he's been able to maintain his, his diabetes-free state. Um, he has had a little bit of regain of weight, and he has had to add a second drug. But relative to the normal course of somebody who starts to develop type 2 diabetes, I think Venkat has done very well by treating the root cause of disease rather than engaging the traditional medical establishment such as adding more and more medications, insulin, endocrinology appointments. So here's an exciting insight that we learned from Venkat and others is that many of your patients are just about three weeks away from reversing a deadly disease because Venkat reported to me that his sugars got better within just a couple weeks. It didn't take the full three months. And so this is supported by a lot of research. So for example, this study uh, was done in people with type 2 diabetes and they followed 20 men in a metabolic ward, this is a live-in program where all the food that they eat is provided to them by the facility. And at this facility, they gave people a high-carbohydrate, high-fiber diet that was very low in fat. So they were able to boost their fiber intake all the way up to 65 grams. They were boosted their starch uh, all the way up to 314 grams. Now, a lot of people think that starch is to be avoided when you have type 2 diabetes. But it turns out that the starch is not the root cause of the disease. It is, it is uh, actually fat accumulating inside the cells of the muscle and the liver. And so this, this approach was a low-fat diet, only 18 grams of fat per day. And what happened in these men in just 16 days is the majority of them were able to stop their insulin 
use, and the average insulin requirement dropped from 26 to 11. So very significant improvement in insulin resistance uh, in just 16 days, less than three weeks. Total cholesterol, of course, comes down when you eat a more plant-based diet. That's one of the most reliable things you will see. Um, here's another group of people who were suffering from a complication of type 2 diabetes called the painful diabetic neuropathy. So this is a form of the nerve disease that you can get from type 2 diabetes in which you're experiencing very uncomfortable burning or other kinds of painful uh, experience in, particularly in the feet and sometimes in the hands. And this, in this case, it was 21 participants who had been experiencing this condition for years. Uh, and they came to this live-in program, so it was a similar live-in program, similar diet, low fat, high fiber. And what happened in just as, as short as four days, but uh, by six, day 16, 17 of, of the 21 were pain-free by day 16. So the majority are pain-free by 16 days. Some people were pain-free in as little as four days, well before even the sugars had come down dramatically. So here's a third case example. Uh, uh, and this was a study done, this is the famous lifestyle heart trial by Dean Ornish in which he took people with advanced heart disease experiencing stable angina pain, stable angina, and these folks were randomized to either his lifestyle intervention, which included, again, a low-fat vegetarian diet, stop smoking, stress management, and moderate exercise, or a control group. And then what they found is that those who, who went through his program in just 24 days, there was a 91% reduction in the frequency of angina. So the, that those episodes of chest pain were 91% reduced. This group was followed for another five years, so a total of five years of follow-up. And what they found is that those who were in his treatment program were uh, re regressed their coronary disease. They were able to cause the coronary disease that they had to regress, as measured both by uh, visualizing the plaque on, uh, on coronary catheterization imaging and by coronary events, a 44% reduction in coronary events over the, over the five years. So less heart attacks, less strokes, less coronary death for people who went through the Ornish program. So if, if our, our patient Jane had come to us later, the other thing, the other important point to note is that the, the natural history of coronary diseases gets worse. This is the control group, and notice how their plaque is getting worse and worse with time. That's the natural history if we don't do anything for people with coronary disease. So if we had done nothing with Jane, if she had come in to see us later, or if we had not taken the approach to treat the root cause of her disease, she might have started developing chest pain maybe a few years later. So what are we going to do with Jane? Well, a Jane too often, it seems like people in that condition who start developing chest pain and getting the, the angina pain, they'll get a, a, tre a, a treadmill test or a stress test of some kind. And when that stress test says uh, abnormal findings, very frequently people end up getting either a stent or getting a coronary artery bypass grafting, a, a bypass grafting surgery. And the problem with getting a stent is it does not solve the problem. It doesn't treat the root cause. It doesn't prevent subsequent heart attacks. It doesn't make you live longer. It doesn't even prevent chest pain. We know that from sham, multiple sham controlled trials, such as the COURAGE trial and the ischemia trial. And the problem with coronary bypass grafting is, number one, it comes at the risk of very serious risks, uh, such as cognitive uh, impairment after the surgery or kidney failure or perioperative mortality, meaning dying shortly after the surgery. Um, and, and, it, and it instills a relatively small or modest benefit of probably less than 1% of people <coughs> uh, benefit in the form of uh, avoiding death. So meanwhile, you look at Ornish's results and we see really no, no risk to doing a healthy lifestyle intervention, maybe, maybe injuries as you start exer exercising more, but <coughs> a very significant benefit. I mean, the number needed to treat was roughly about two. So for every two people who go through it, you prevent one coronary event. That's a dramatic benefit. So here's an exciting insight. We can reverse <clears throat> most effectively if we find those teachable moments early. So one of the things I recommend that doctors and primary care providers become is this guy, Dr. Catastrophe. 
you want to catastrophize. You want to think about what could be going wrong. So what, what, what I call it is teachable moments. We want to create those teachable moments for patients that convince them that things are not hunky-dory because we generate a lot of numbers in our lab results. And, and we get used to, to seeing numbers that are, that are suboptimal, that reflect the beginnings of diseases, but we tend to just ignore these things. So the, I'm talking about a hemoglobin A1C that's getting into the prediabetes range, or an LDL cholesterol over 70, a, a systolic blood pressure over 120. These, these numbers are thought to be pretty close to normal, but we know that people, even people with an LDL of 80, or a systolic blood pressure of 120 can have a heart attack. Nobody's gonna be surprised. So it's not till we get these numbers down lower that you get into the heart attack free zone. Most people with an ALT over 25 are starting to develop some fat in the liver. Uh, the, when the kidneys function is getting down below 70%, that means we're getting close to stage three chronic kidney disease. Now's the time to intervene. If your high sensitivity C-reactive protein is over one, that means you have some inflammation in your body. Homocysteine over 10, if you have an elevated lipoprotein little a or an ApoE4 um, gene, a, one or two copies of that gene, then you've got some risks that it would be good to know about, and this is a time when we really want to step on the gas in terms of improving our lifestyle. Another thing to worry about and, to, and catastrophize about is the fact that we are producing new generations of future patients for us because uh, for one thing, research suggests that more than half of today's children will be obese adults. And the other thing that I observe, having seen my kids go through the education system in the United States, is that we don't emphasize health very much. We don't emphasize nutrition enough. And so, but we do have a nutrition class every day, and it's called Lunch. It's a 30-minute nutrition class in which we teach kids, we model for kids what food really is. So we're, what are we teaching them to eat? Stuffed crust pizza, pizza, chicken parmesan sandwich, crispy chicken drumstick, a lot of chicken, chicken, cheese, cheese pizza, and dinner rolls and, and refined carbohydrates, sloppy joe sandwich, processed meat even. So, you know, and ultimately, it's not very far from this. And this is what Americans tend to eat. It's, it's devoid of fiber, a lot of deep fried foods, processed meats, um, and, and high, very, very salty. So this is vascular, this is toxic to our blood vessels, this promotes heart disease, and this is what we're teaching our kids to eat. And what's more about those foods is that <clears throat> they, they, they promote cancer. And I would argue that any of our patients who are worried about cancer, want to prevent cancer, or especially the patients who have a diagnosis of cancer and want to, want to be a cancer survivor as long as possible and don't want that cancer to take their life, well, they should know about the American Institute of Cancer Research. They're, they have a blueprint to beat cancer. So this blueprint to beat cancer is based on all, all the best available science. It says, what are the ways we can prevent cancer for, from coming back? And what are the ways we can um, prevent it in the first place? So it is, it is mostly the same pillars of lifestyle medicine as be a healthy weight, be physically active, eat a diet rich in whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and beans. Limit consumption of red and processed meat. Limit consumption of sugar-sweetened drinks. Limit alcohol. Limit fast foods and other processed foods high in fat, starches, and sugars. So unfortunately, we can do a lot better for our kids. But an exciting insight is that some foods, let's look at the opposite end of the spectrum of foods. Some foods are so healthy that they are downright medicinal. I wanted to give you an, a sense of the excitement uh, of, of the the wisdom in, that is embodied in nutrition science. So for one thing, this, this, the flavonoids, you can see the antioxidants in the fruits and vegetables, and you really want to eat the rainbow. The more of these colorful fruits and vegetables you eat, especially these dark green leafy vegetables, uh, the more nutrition you are packing into your body, magnesium, potassium, flavonoids, and fiber, and all the rest. Ginger powder, I'm just taking some random examples. We don't have time to go deep into the nutrition science, but ginger powder in a lot of multiple uh, randomized placebo-controlled trials even, we find that it is, it is an anti-nausea medicine. It uh, is effective at alleviating menstrual cramps and heavy menstrual bleeding. It was tested head-to-head -head against sumatriptan and was found to be equivalent for migraine headaches. It has been found at work for osteoarthritis pain and muscle pain uh, it is associated with reduced insulin resistance, reduced 
total body inflammation as measured by this C-reactive protein test. So how much? About a, an eighth to a, a full teaspoon a day of ginger powder. You can dissolve it in your green tea, which is another one of those superfoods that for which we have a lot of research saying this is downright healthy stuff. And, and the research suggests that it seems to be heart healthy and prevent heart attacks. Uh, it lowers LDL cholesterol and blood pressure. It reduces insulin resistance. Um, it is associated with reduced incidence of cognitive decline, reduced influenza infections. It is a mouthwash as, as effective as chlorhexidine-based medicinal mouthwashes. And it's associated with reduced cancers of the breast, ov ovary, and lung. Our operating principle number five, there is a vast body of lifestyle science, and we probably should have a low threshold to deploy it since lifestyle interventions have healthy side effects. My best resource for studying this lifestyle science is through the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. I encourage you to become board certified if you are a health professional in lifestyle medicine. It is a, a great discipline. In terms of uh, for the public consumable information and for yourself if you're a practitioner, um, The Game Changers is a very scientific uh, documentary um, that is on free on uh, Netflix. Uh, and my favorite resource for um, information about um, supplements and uh, certain foods is uh, this consumerlab.com. As you know, we don't have a functioning food and drug administration with regard to dietary supplements. They don't measure products and make sure that the products have what it says on the label, and they don't ma even make sure that the products are free of contamination. So that's where a service like Consumer Lab comes in. They are able to act, they actually measure products they, they're looking for, are there heavy metal contaminations? What, and what's more, they do a really thorough job of, of, of publishing a synopsis of what does the science say about each, each of the topics, and there's hundreds of topics on the website, but examples, extra virgin olive oil, or uh, fish oil supplements, or vitamin D, or magnesium supplements, or probiotics, you know, are they effective? What are they effective for? CoQ10, et cetera. Green tea even is, is in there. <clears throat> and of course, my favorite is nutritionfacts.org. This is Dr. Michael Greger. Uh, so this fine website has thousands of nutrition videos, all evidence-based. So there's no guesswork. I mean, the whole video is him just showing scientific papers, but it's very interesting and very empowering. You can subscribe to the daily alerts. Dr. Greger recently wrote a book called How Not to Age, which is a very thorough, in-depth investigation into what does the science say about how we can preserve life expectancy and avoid early, uh, early death. And just to give you a very quick flavor for what's in this book, um, he, he cites this interesting research in which <clears throat> um, per participant researchers took 800 participants and followed them for over 20 years. And they, they, had, and they looked at 146 different nutrients in the diet. And they said, which nutrients are most associated with longevity? And they found that by more than, more than an order of magnitude, more than several orders of magnitude, this one nutrient stands out. It's called spermidine. Most people haven't heard of spermidine, but in fact, the, the top third consumers of spermidine in this investigation did live seven years longer on average than the bottom third. And there wasn't a big difference in the, in the thirds. Um, so in fact, if you look at other research on spermidine, we find that um, spermidine is associated with improved memory function. There's actually a study where they randomized people to a dinner roll that either had um, wheat germ spermidine in it or uh, wheat bran, lower spermidine, and they found a two-point improvement in the mini mental status score for those who were randomized to the higher spermidine dinner roll. This is unheard of. We don't really have other interventions that will bump your memory like that. Uh, there's very few, precious few but reduce cardiovascular mortality, reduce cancer mortality, longer life ex lifespan, as I spoke. Lots of evidence that spermidine might be healthy. Where do you get spermidine? This is where you gotta study the science. You gotta, uh, you gotta, you gotta be in the know because it's not necessarily gonna come to you naturally. So you gotta go seek it out. It is in your tempeh, which is super healthy from several uh, uh, directions, but so tempeh over a salad, it's hard to get a healthier lunch than that. Mushrooms are a, a powerful source of spermidine. Of all the fruits, it ends up being mangoes, for whatever reason, mangoes. And the most concentrated source of spermidine is this stuff, 
What is it? It's wheat germ. So of all the milks, I think soy milk is the healthiest. For one thing, because it's a source of spermidine. There's like about two, two and a half milligrams of spermidine in a cup of soy milk. But it's also associated with lower cholesterol, lower blood pressure, and lower risk of certain cancers. One of my favorite resources to recommend to patients is Dr. Greger's Daily Dozen. It's basically an app that is free. It's a very dumb app. It doesn't try to track you, but it's just sort of an a, a easy to use checklist that reminds you to eat your three servings of beans, eat your three servings of fruits, get your greens, get your flax seeds, your grains, your exercise, your berries, your cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, your, your other vegetables, your nuts, your spices, and your beverages. So here's an example of how I use nutrition science. Uh, this gentleman comes to see me with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, chronic lung disease. What are we going to do for this gentleman? Well, traditional medicine offers this algorithm of which inhalers we're going to use when. Um, and <clears throat> what, what it basically is intended to do is to prevent exacerbations. So it, it is not intended to treat the root cause of disease. So this is important. We don't want to have exacerbations. We don't want to get hospitalized for COPD. Um, infections. But can we do better? So here's where I go to Google. I type Gregor COPD and I, I find this video that I had seen, Treating COPD with Diet, which shares this science. This is fascinating science in which <clears throat> uh, 120 people with COPD were randomized to either uh, nutrition counseling for their COPD or a control group. And then they, they were followed by th for three years. So the group who got the nutrition counseling actually did more than double their fruit and vegetable intake uh, over a baseline of about one serving a day was their original. And then afterwards, they were eating about two and a half servings a day. And the control group remained in this gray bars, remained one, about one serving a day for the three years. So what happened to the, to the two groups over the three years of this study? <clears throat> well, those who, got the, who, who did not get the nutrition counseling experienced the natural course of COPD, which is to have the lung function decline year on year. So this percent predicted FEV1 goes down year on year on year. Whereas those who got the nutrition counseling actually saw this lung function improve. This is unheard of. We don't have medicines that do that, that make your lung function improve over time. So this is what treating the root cause looks like. But it was, importantly, the lungs are a vascular organ and they respond to nutrition much like other organs. Is this an outlier? Is there other science? This study of <clears throat> 44,000 Swedish men looked at people without COPD and followed them for 14 years. And what they find is that there's a dose response effect. Those who ate more and more fruits and vegetables had lower and lower rates of chronic lung disease. So what's more, there's this research showing that cured meats may increase COPD incidence. We think it's the nitrates in the cured meats, but what they find is that subjects who consumed cured meats at least 14 times a month were 78% more likely to develop chronic lung disease than those who did not. And, and, and the people who ate more cured meats had more severe lung disease. This is another study of people who had COPD, and they looked at how much uh, cured meats they were eating. They found the people who ate more cured meats had a higher rate of admission to the, to the hospital for their for their lung disease. So an exciting insight, the lungs respond to nutritional interventions. How often in the course of your practice of medicine has anybody talked to your lung patients about their nutrition? But it so happens that it's, it's every other organ is the same story. So our, all our organs respond to nutrition. And operating principle number six, our, our last operating principle is to maximize our effectiveness as clinicians in lifestyle medicine. We need to live the healthiest lifestyle ourselves. So a lot of people in medicine experience are experiencing burnout, and this can come from lots of reasons, being overworked, but it could also be argued that our, our neglect of our own personal health and our own lifestyle behaviors can contribute. So when we get burned, when we're getting burned out, we're not sleeping enough, we're too busy to exercise, we're neglecting relationships, and these are exactly the medicine that the doctor is ordering to treat your burnout. So one of the most important things we need for our burnout is we need the pillars of lifestyle medicine. The other reason to practice lifestyle medicine on ourselves is that healthy doctors spread healthy behaviors. 
So we know from research that uh, when a doctor was a smoker, they were much less likely and less effective to emphasize quitting smoking. Doctors who don't exercise don't counsel their patients to exercise as much. Doctors who uh, are heavy don't counsel their patients who weigh less than them to lose weight, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we owe it to our patients to live the healthiest life we can and walk the talk. And our, our last exciting insight is that switching to a healthy lifestyle and plant-based nutrition is the biggest win-win ever. And why do I say that? Well, for one thing, I just showed you that it has the power of preventing and even reversing many, if not most, if not all, Western diseases. But the other reason is, maybe this is the most important reason, is your family. Because when you change to healthier eating, when you change to healthier lifestyle, it is going to rub off on your family. And then finally, the planet. It turns out there's a huge intersection between planetary health environmental health, and the choices we make with nutrition. There are not one, not just climate change, but nine planetary boundaries that scientists are monitoring that we have the potential of exceeding. Our planet has only so many resources. It is a limited planet. And if we exceed these boundaries, then what we are doing is we are overusing the planet. We are burning up resources uh, ir ir uh, irrevocably. And so examples would be land usage, water, fresh water change, biochemical flows, ocean acidification, atmospheric aerosols, stratospheric ozone depletion, novel che uh, chemicals, uh, and certainly climate change. So unfortunately, agriculture is destabilizing the Earth system, according to a new study. They find that, that agriculture is contributing to all nine of those planetary boundaries. And and, and this study quantitated it, the, the, the black dots are the, are the contribution of agriculture. And what you can see is that to many of these uh, planetary boundaries, agriculture is playing a very outsized role. Uh, and it could be argued that climate change is more than just this little bit because one of the things we know from climate change is that, uh, from the research around climate change, is that agriculture uses up about half of the world's habitable land. And, and but for all, but uh, of all that land, 77% of agriculture is for livestock. So we feed most of the crops that we produce, we give it to animals. And that 77% of the land only produces 18% of our calories. It's an incredibly inefficient system. Recall that we live in a world where thousands of people, thousands of children starve to death every day on this planet. But we're giving food to the animals instead of the people. So it's, it's the food that that we grow for ourselves that's by far more efficient and productive in terms of uh, producing most of our calories and most of our protein. And it turns out that the blame is not evenly distributed, that of all the livestock, cows are the real hogs, says the Union of Concerned Scientists, in that they use a great, a greatly outsized uh, share of the land, the water, and the other resources. This is what's happening in the Amazon. The Amazon's reaching a close, getting very close to a tipping point where it's going to not be a rainforest anymore. It's going to be a savanna and or desert. And that's because of deforestation. And why are they deforesting the Amazon? They are doing it to grow crops or to graze cattle. There's another pandemic. You're, you're familiar with COVID-19. There's another one that's in our midst. 2019, it took one and a quarter million lives worldwide which is on par with what COVID-19 has done over the last uh, three or four, three years at, on average. Uh, and whereas it's predicted to grow to 10 million deaths a year at a cost of $100 trillion per year. This is multi-drug resistant bacteria. So it's another pandemic that we face. And the reason that we think uh, this is happening in large part is because of our excessive use of antibiotics. 70% of all antibiotic use is for livestock. So the U World Health Organization has been decrying for years, stop using antibiotics in healthy animals. See, the, the, the industry, the animal agriculture industry uses antibiotics in healthy animals so that they can overcrowd them a little bit more, so that they grow fatter a little faster and they can make a little more money. But it is absolutely not healthy for the planet. So we have a choice between the beef chili on the left and the bean chili on the right. And I would argue the bean chili, we are not suffering. We are eating a wonderful mixture of tastes and textures 
but we are getting the fiber. We are not getting the saturated fat. We are eating anti-inflammatory. We're eating rich mix of flavonoids. And, and so the bean, the, the bean chili is far healthier than the beef chili. And I would also argue that we have a choice between either continuing to have the beef chili as we do or have a livable planet for our children because the planet simply cannot support billions of people living a Western style lifestyle in which everybody's eating meat and everybody's eating red meat. So there's our, our six operating principles that we covered today. The same six lifestyle factors can treat many illnesses. It's better to treat the root cause of disease than to treat the symptoms. Many chronic diseases are reversible if treated early enough and with a high enough dose of lifestyle change. We want to go for more than moderation. Nutrition is super important. Frequently adding more unprocessed plant foods is, is alone is, has the power of reversing disease. There is a vast body of lifestyle science. We probably should have a low threshold to deploy it because it is, it's downright healthy. And number six is that to maximize our effectiveness as clinicians with lifestyle medicine, we need to live our healthiest lifestyle ourselves. And with that, I welcome questions or feedback. You can reach out to me. Thank you for your attention and all the best to you.